Okay, back to chemical bonding. We were talking about covalent bonding, which uh, always involves the sharing of two electrons uh, between atoms uh, to form a two electron covalent bond. Um, and it's always between two non-metals. So in, in, in this case here, we had uh, two atoms of hydrogen, both ostensibly non-metals, uh, coming together to form a, a two electron covalent bond. Again, with all of our bonding, what, uh, what, what really uh, pushes these uh, bond, chemical bonds to happen is the uh, formation of a full octet or a noble gas configuration uh, for both atoms uh, in, this, in this case. Um, we had gone uh, with hydrogen to start us out on a journey looking at di uh, uh, diatomic elements. Uh, we find that there are seven diatomic elements in the periodic table, uh, and we had talked about the bond structure for each. Uh, lastly, we had introduced the standard bonding model, um, which, uh, again, if you forget uh, everything else, remember this right here, carbon, four covalent bonds around carbon, no lone electron pairs. Nitrogen, three covalent bonds, one lone electron pair. Uh, oxygen, always two covalent bonds emanating from it with two lone electron pairs. And finally, you have fluorine here, but really it's any halogen always has one covalent bond emanating from it and three lone electron pairs. So this standard bonding model really gives uh, us a lot of power. Uh, as long as, again, we remember these rules that we see right here, uh, we can pretty much uh, draw an infinite number of covalent molecules. Um, so, you know, something uh, like this right here, don't let this scare you. This is a very large uh, uh, covalent molecule. First of all, it's, con it's uh, comprised only of uh, uh, nonmetals. And uh, you'll find that on, e on this molecule, every single atom has, uh, uh, adheres rather to the standard bonding model, which we see here. Um, you know, whether we're talking about halogens with one covalent bond and three lone electron pairs, uh, to oxygen, two covalent bonds, two lone electron pairs, multiple bonds can come into the fray here. That's still oxygen, two covalent bonds emanating from it, two lone pairs. Uh, we can have them between carbons or anything you like, as long as all of these uh, criteria, or the very few criteria we're talking about, are adhered to, uh, this is a viable uh, organic molecule, or rather viable covalent molecule. Um, now, just as I've showed you a, uh, a valid uh, covalent molecule, it's very easy to find, uh, mi find mistakes in, in these uh, types of things. So if I came up with another molecule here and asked you to uh, say, so we'll pick out the atoms which don't adhere to the standard bonding model. And so all we have to do is sort of uh, keep in mind this is the standard bonding model. Immediately we would see some things that are problematic. Um, here this oxygen has three bonds emanating from it with one lone electron pair. We know oxygen has two and two. So we can go through this and pick out the, uh, the problem atoms. Here this carbon has three bonds emanating from it. No lone electron pairs. Well, we all know carbon has four covalent bonds, not three, so that would be a problem as well. This carbon, we're going the other way now. Um, if we look at this carbon, uh, there's five covalent bonds emanating from it. And, uh, so that is a problem. Now, some of these uh, look really weird, something like this nitrogen right here. Uh, but if we think about it, this nitrogen atom has three covalent bonds emanating from it. They all happen to be tied up in one triple bond, but it's three, and we have one lone pair uh, uh, of electrons on it. So that does indeed uh, adhere to the standard bonding model, so that's okay. Moving along, let's see if we can find some uh, some other problems. There, oh, that halogen right there, that, uh, that chlorine has one covalent bond emanating from it, two lone electron pairs. Again, we, uh, we know that uh, it should be three uh, lone electron pairs, so that's problematic as well. That uh, hydrogen right here, this hydrogen, hydrogen always only has one covalent bond emanating from it. Uh, is the classic end cap, you know, hydrogen is always on an end, if you will, 
Um, that's the one way to tell it. Here, now we have hydrogen with two bonds emanating from it. That cannot happen. So thus, that uh, is a problem as well. So whether we're trying to ascertain the viability of an, of an entire molecule, uh, which we saw over here, or to pick out uh, problem areas in a molecule or problem atoms that don't adhere to the standard bonding model, we can do that as well. So sometimes some shortcuts are taken in drawn, drawing co covalent molecules. Over here on the uh, upper left-hand side, we have uh, so these uh, three molecules, which should be uh, somewhat familiar now. Uh, we've got uh, a, a carbon molecule, a nitrogen-containing molecule, and an oxygen molecule. Now these structures uh, have both uh, covalent bonds in them as well as lone electron pairs. So sometimes we're going to find that these, uh, these structures, that when we draw them, the lone electron pairs are optional. They're optional, but the covalent bonds, of course, are always necessary. These uh, optional lone electron pairs uh, are only if we, we're not looking for what is called, or what I'm terming, a Lewis structure. So here's another molecule right here. This would be the, the Lewis structure, uh, the proper Lewis structure of all of these molecules, bearing the proper number of covalent bonds and the proper number, if any, of lone electron pairs residing on the atoms. Sometimes we take shortcuts, and, and I will too, where we dispense with the, uh, the, the lone electron pairs, uh, even though we're still uh, assuming that they're there. So uh, if we have a structure which is, has uh, covalent bonds and lone electron pairs, that is a bona fide Lewis structure. Lewis implies covalent bonds and lone pairs if they exist. So here's some various covalent compounds that would be considered a Lewis structure, covalent bonds and lone electron pairs. Now I could draw all of these if I wasn't specifically looking for a Lewis structure. All of these I could just draw the bond structure and leave out the lone pairs. The lone pairs, as I said before, are, uh, are optional. And again, if I just ask you to draw or to, rec to, to, to think about a structure, notice I didn't say Lewis structure on here, we could, if we wanted, draw all of these without their lone electron pairs. We could do that. It's optional. We could put, we could leave them in, we could take them out or, or whatever. However, if you're tasked with identifying or drawing a Lewis structure, well, in this case, all of our covalent bonds, as well as any and all lone electron pair structure must be drawn in. That's just a distinction that we're gonna be uh, moving forward with. Now, as I've said before, in this course, we like predictability. Um, predictability means that our, uh, our models, our bonding models, will be uh, adhered to every time. The one model we're working with right now, the standard bonding model, we expect it to uh, work uh, and, and be adhered to all of the time. We just left a, 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 sli a couple of slides ago, we looked at, looked at that. There are, however, some exceptions to the standard bonding model, also written here as the octet rule. It means the same thing, um, and really, uh, what this uh, standard bonding model shows in covalent structure is that every atom in the structure gets either eight atoms for an octet, or at least uh, we could uh, look at it more generally as a, uh, the equivalent of a, a, f a f full octet or a uh, uh, noble gas configuration. That's what we're looking at. But there are three examples when we have exceptions to this. And these exceptions are because these molecules are doing the best they can, and they still cannot afford a noble gas configuration around each uh, atom in the structure. So we're going to be looking at three of these. This is typically a slide I don't really like because I like predictability. I like uh, adherence to a model. But sometimes molecules become, uh, become prevalent enough so that this does have to be shown. So our first exception to the octet rule uh, would be what are considered odd electron molecules. What we're going to be looking at primarily are uh, oxides of nitrogen, meaning that it's made up of nitrogen and oxygen. Now, since oxygen has a, uh, an even number of valence electrons, six, 
and nitrogen has an odd number of valence electrons, five, any way that those two are put together is going to end up with an odd number. If it's an odd number, there's no way at least one of those atoms is able to have eight atoms around it, an octet, because eight is an even number. So uh, in this case, that these molecules do the best they can. Uh, for instance, right here, this oxide of nitrogen is able to bring its, uh, its uh, electrons together to form a covalent structure where oxygen itself has, can claim eight uh, electrons, but the nitrogen on the other side can only claim seven. And the reason for this is it does the best it can. It simply cannot do it. Um, another oxide of nitrogen here uh, manifests itself such that uh, the covalent structure gives the, both oxygens uh, within here uh, eight electrons around them in a weird way, but it does have eight. Uh, however, there's only seven uh, allowable or possible on that nitrogen uh, atom in the middle. So therefore, it is found wanting. Um, it is not as stable as it could be because when you have a nice full octet that's or, or a uh, noble gas configuration that infers stability to the molecule it should not come as a surprise that these oxides of nitrogen are actually uh, quite reactive species and that's because of that instability about that nitrogen in uh, each of these cases another exception to the octet rule uh, would be uh, with uh, respect to atoms which are further down in the in, uh, in, in rows in the periodic table, elements in the third row uh, and, and higher uh, in the periodic table can have more than four electron pairs surrounding them. Now, we're not going to be going into the uh, specific theory behind that, but understand in that third row uh, of the periodic table, we now start to have D uh, electrons or a D shell so that we're able to put some uh, additional electrons in there. Um, these would be basically we're looking at compounds of sulfur and phosphorus. Sulfur and phosphorus. Here we have, uh, now don't worry about these fluorines, these are just in for uh, for show, but look at the, the, the central atom in here. We have uh, two, four, six, eight, ten uh, ad, uh, electrons emanating from that in five bonds. That's greater than, uh, than, than eight. So it's not eight, it's not an octet, it is greater than that. Um, this uh, sulfur compound, again, we're not looking at the fluorine surrounding it, but rather that central atom sulfur has six pairs of electrons, six covalent bonds emanating from it, uh, and, uh, and thus does not adhere to the, the octet rule. Um, it basically follows uh, other uh, other models, which we're not going to be going into here, so thus we view it as an exception. The last exception to the octet rule would be compounds specifically of beryllium and boron. See, we here we have uh, compounds where beryllium is a central atom and boron is a central atom. Now, because beryllium only has two valence electrons, it can only have at most around it, uh, emanating from it, two uh, two covalent bonds, and that's only four electrons. So it's electron deficient. It's electron deficient because we're not uh, approaching eight, the number eight, which would be four of four uh, uh, bonds around it. Um, similarly, with uh, compounds of boron, boron has three valence electrons around it, and thus uh, it can only have three bonds emanating from it in a standard bonding situation. So uh, it can only have a total of six, uh, uh, six electrons around it. Again, not being able to approach that octet or eight electrons. So if you'll remember uh, a, a few lectures ago, we were talking about trends in the periodic table as you go across a row or down a column. Uh, we have sort of an increase or a decrease in character of, uh, a, of various things such as uh, a metallic character, first ionization energy, atomic size, and so on. Now that we're somewhat steeped in the uh, an understanding of covalent uh, structure uh, or covalent bonding, I want to introduce yet another trend in the periodic table. This is electronegativity. 
Electronegativity is an inherent quality uh, of an atom of an element to draw bonding electron density towards itself. So uh, the, within a covalent bond, we have two electrons. Um, but And those two electrons are shared between the two uh, nuclei. Now, the assumption is, has been up till now that that sharing is equal, but that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes it's equal, but sometimes those two electrons involved in that bond spend more time around one atom than the other, because that one atom is drawing those two electrons towards itself more strongly than the other atom in the bond. We are only looking at electronegativity uh, uh, with respect to covalent bonding, and that's why, that's why we're finally uh, bringing that up here. But it is indeed the ability of an atom uh, of an element to draw bonding electron density towards itself. So as I said before, this is a, the electronegativity of an atom of an element um, is inherent, meaning it uh, is essentially a physical property of that element. Um, here is a uh, structure or a, a sort of a, a mock-up of the periodic table showing the electronegativity values for each element. Now notice on here, so here in, on, in each case we have uh, an element, and here I'm circling bromine, and there's a number below it. That's the electronegativity number. Usually on a, a normal periodic table, the number underneath the elemental symbol is the atomic mass, but this is just a, a, a mock-up for that. So uh, at least on this particular one, we have our electronegativity values written uh, below, the, uh, below the chemical symbol. Notice now we are, uh, there is a trend here. Generally, electronegativity increases across a row, increases across a row, and decreases down a column. Increases across a row, decreases down a column. Now, really, since I, I said before that we're really only going to be uh, discussing or looking at electronegativity with respect to covalent bonds, we know covalent bonds only occur between nonmetals. So really, the only ones we need to worry about here are essentially these ones. So these are, are only, uh, oh, th those are our nonmetals. You know, the rest of them are all metals and we're not gonna be considering electronegativity on anything other than covalent bonding, which must occur between two nonmetals. So really we've decreased uh, the numbers. So really the numbers that matter uh, with respect to uh, electronegativity are within the, uh, generally within the circle that I, I just made. These numbers are, are absolutely uh, uh, available to you, um, and we'll be working with that, them somewhat. Um, notice now you can really see within the nonmetals that increase across a row and the decrease down the column. Very, very uh, obvious uh, in, in this sense. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is that it seems to come to a pinnacle up here. Um, if they're increasing across a row and increasing up a column, well, we sort of end up at the upper uh, right-hand side of the periodic table with the element fluorine. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. It has an electronegativity value of 4.0. That's as high as the electronegativity value table goes, and fluorine is it. Notice also on here, we, uh, we're sort of missing something on the periodic table. This final column here is the halogens. It's the halogens. We, we know the, 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 the last column on the right-hand side of the periodic table is actually the noble gases, but they're not shown here. And why might that be? Well, uh, the noble gases are happy just the way they are. They have their noble gas configuration. It's very, very rare, almost impossible, to get a covalent bond between between an atom of a noble gas and another uh, and another uh, nonmetal element. So therefore, since uh, in a nutshell, noble gases do not covalent bond. They don't participate in covalent bonding. Their electronegativity value, whatever it may be, is of no consequence to us. That is why it's not, uh, it's, it's not shown right in, in this, uh, on this mock-up right here. Now, because nonmetal atoms participating in a covalent bond 
have sometimes, most of the time really, different electronegative, electronegativity values, we have most of the time what we would term a polar covalent bond. There is a dipole there, meaning uh, within the two atoms and the covalent bond between them, that uh, bond is polarized in one direction or the other towards the more electronegative element because the electrons in that two electron covalent bond are being pulled more closely to it uh, than the other one because it has a higher electronegativity value. So therefore, the bonding electrons are shared unequally, unequally. Let's look at a, uh, a compound of hydrogen and fluorine. Hydrogen has a, an electronegativity of 2.1. Fluorine, the most electronegative element, has an electronegativity of 4.0. So let's look at a, 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 a description of this here of, of our covalent bond. So over on the left, we have hydrogen. Over on the right, we have fluorine. And these dots in the middle here are essentially, at any given uh, snapshot in time, the probability of finding uh, either of the two electrons in that covalent bond around either nucleus. We can clearly see over on the side of fluorine that the, that dot structure is more uh, dense uh, and it's, it's less dense over by the hydrogen. Well, that's because you know, in just in this representation, fluorine has a higher electronegativity value, so therefore it has a uh, it, it has more of a propensity to draw those. Uh, those bonding electrons towards itself. Notice it doesn't steal them completely, but uh, the, the electrons tend to spend more of their time around fluorine than they do occasionally around hydrogen. So uh, it's much more, uh, much more polarized, if you will, towards fluorine. So we can, so this would be considered a polar covalent bond. And we could represent that with an arrow. So a, a, a polar covalent bond, we sort of put an arrow in the direction of the, uh, the more electronegative atom, uh, and we put a little crosshatch on it. That would be uh, a way of showing the dipole moment of this bond, really, the dipole moment of this molecule. Now, a moment, at least in physics, is a, uh, a description of uh, a snapshot in time, if you will, of some particular quality, in this case of electronegativity. Um, so this dipole moment, if I said, draw me the direction of the dipole moment of this, uh, of this molecule, I'd be wanting to draw a cross-stitched arrow like this when, uh, along the, uh, the same uh, parallel with the bond itself, but, uh, but towards the more electronegative element. So here we have a polar covalent bond. Uh, it would stand to reason that any covalent bond between usually two different atoms would be considered polar because almost always, not always, but almost always, they're going to be of different electronegativities. So we could uh, make up a uh, sort of a, a, a way of looking at this uh, in that we can Think of uh, a way of defining these. Now, we had a polar covalent bond here in which we have an unequal sharing of that bonding electron pair. We saw an example of that with that uh, high, uh, HF uh, molecule uh, previously. But we can also have, if we had equal electronegativities between the atoms, we could also have a nonpolar covalent bond as long as the electronegativities of each of the atoms were equal. Uh, a slam dunk example or representation of this would be any of our diatomics, like molecular chlorine, Cl2, H2, N2, O2. We are assured, we don't even need to look at the electronegativities on these elements because we know they're the same. You know, bo bo both chlorines, they're both going to have the same electronegativity, and the, the, uh, because they have the same pull on those two electrons, those, uh, it's going to be a nonpolar covalent bond. Again, this, uh, a polar covalent bond is uh, like almost 
all other covalent bonds as long as the two atoms participating in that covalent bond have different electronegativities, which is almost always the case where uh, we would end up with a, a nonpolar covalent, or I'm sorry, a polar covalent bond. Uh, this, we seem to be tracking here from nonpolar towards polar. What might be the end result? Well, uh, it's not real. We don't really think of uh, uh, electronegativity in the, in, in, uh, with respect to metals and nonmetals together. But the the, the very very uh, end of this spectrum might be considered an ionic bond where there's so much polarity from one compared with the other that that'll, those bonding pair of electrons have gone totally over to one of the uh, partners in an ionic bond, which is by definition what an ionic bond is. It's an electrostatic bond. So um, as far as covalent bonding goes, these are the two we're going to be dealing with, you know, polar versus nonpolar covalent bond. Um, I just put in ionic bonding here just to show what might be considered the end of that spectrum, but we really don't think of polarity with respect to uh, uh, ionic bonding in general. So if you'll remember back at the very beginning of this chapter, when we were looking at ionic bonding, we had a particular way of creating an ionic Lewis structure. Do you remember that? It had those uh, you know, four pairs of electrons around the nonmetal and the brackets and all of that business. And I had said that uh, we, we're going to be looking at another type of Lewis diagram. We've actually act drawn these already. Uh, uh, adhering to the standard bonding model, but Lewis structures of covalent compounds. And these look much different than the Lewis structures of ionic compounds, and the way of achieving them is much different. As I said, we've been drawing these all day long already. Basically, it is adhering to the standard bonding model. Uh, and if, so long as we adhere to the standard bonding model, we're drawing correct covalent Lewis structures. Remember that uh, this previous slide where am I going to draw a structure or a Lewis structure? If I cho choose to do a Lewis structure, it better have all the covalent bonds as well as all of the lone electron pairs. Um, that's what we're talking about here. We're going to be looking at how to approach drawing Lewis diagrams using very simple molecules, not like some of the big ones that I showed you before. Simple meaning essentially one uh, central atom in, in all of these. And I have a set of rules here for drawing a covalent compound. We'll look at a number of examples. Um, but notice uh, we do, do these in order for a reason. Uh, and uh, as long as we keep in order, we're able to uh, work out the, uh, the covalent Lewis uh, diagrams or Lewis structures. Now, I, a word of not caution, but clarity here. Uh, these can be, we can figure out covalent Lewis diagrams, sort of like we were doing before. As long as uh, a molecule as drawn adheres to the standard bonding model, and by that I mean four bonds around carbon, no lone pairs, three bonds around nitrogens, one lone pair, and so on and so forth. That's the standard bonding model. As long as they adhere to it, it's correct. This is just another approach towards that. So here we have five rules here. And the first one is count the valence electrons for all single atoms. Once we do that, arrange terminal atoms around a central atom with some special instructions. Central atom is least electronegative. We're going to go through all this. Hydrogens are always terminal. Then guess the diagram. There's a way of doing that, drawing single bonds, connecting all the atoms, uh, and, uh, and drawing lone electron pairs to have a full octet around each atom except hydrogen. Count again all valence electrons and modify the guess, the guess if necessary. Let's take a look at this. We'll look at an example over here on the upper uh, right-hand side. Let's look at water, H2O. Now, we've drawn the proper Lewis structure of water all day long already. But let's, uh, let, let's just humor me here, and we'll go through it using these five rules. So we're going to count the valence electrons. It's our first task for all of our single atoms. Now, in water, we have ox one oxygen atom that has six valence electrons and two hydrogens, and each of those has one valence electron. So here uh, I'm putting those together, and I come up with eight valence electrons. That is our target, number eight. Okay, fair enough. We'll move on now. Arrange terminal atoms around a central atom. Now, the central atom should be the least electronegative, but 
hydrogens are always terminal, meaning on the outside. So the only atom left in water besides the hydrogens are oxygen. So we have to put that in the center. H hydrogens must always be terminal atoms. Terminal meaning on the periphery, on the outside. So to guess the diagram, we draw single bonds connecting the atoms with that central atom and add lone electron pairs around everything except hydrogen to have a full octet. Well, that's how we would carry that out. We see, we've seen this before, working with the standard bonding model, that that is, that is the correct structure of water. Oxygen has two bonds emanating from it, two lone electron pairs, but pretend we didn't see that. We will uh, uh, move forward, and now we'll count all of the valence electrons we see. So let's look at this. So follow me now on this structure of water. We have two, four, six, eight. So that has eight electrons around oxygen. That's an octet, that's good. And each hydrogen can claim two electrons. It always can. So in this case, the uh, we have verified that that uh, that, that uh, structure is correct and we don't need to move forward because we counted eight total electrons. The structure is correct. But let's look at some other examples. Okay, carbon tetrabromide. Let's draw the Lewis structure, or the proper Lewis structure of that. CBr4, notice I've given you the, uh, the, the chemical uh, structure of that or the chemical formula. So the first thing we have to do is count all of the valence electrons on all of the atoms. Notice we have one carbon and four bromines. So thus, we are going to, so carbon has four valence electrons, one of those, and bromine being a halogen has seven valence electrons. We have four of those. We're gonna add all that up to give 32 valence electrons. Fair enough. Now we have step two, we have to arrange these uh, uh, atoms around a central atom. So carbon, if we look at our table of electronegativities, is less electronegative than bromine, so it is the central atom. And all the rest of them go around the periphery. They are terminal atoms, as we see in this, uh, in this structure here. Now, third, we connect all uh, peripheral atoms to the central atom, and uh, any time we have an atom which requires a, additional uh, uh, lone pairs, we put them in. And here it is. Uh, so now, uh, so and, and again, this may be looking uh, somewhat familiar to us. So we see around a carbon, we have eight, uh, eight valence electrons. And around each bromine, we can count eight valence electrons as well. So uh, by this uh, covalent sharing, uh, we can... Uh, already using the standard bonding model, see that this is correct. But let's now, what we need to do just to, uh, uh, to work with this is we have to count all of our electrons now, covalent bonds and lone pairs. And that means all of these lone pairs have to be counted, two, four, six, uh, 12, 18, 24, and then the four covalent bonds, 26, 28, 30, 32. 32 does indeed uh, uh, come up with the same number as we saw before. So because we have the same number, those uh, the structure that we had drawn of carbon tetrabromide is correct. So let's look at one more where our initial structure might not be correct. And we're going to have to use this uh, the, the, a, a fix that we put in there in order to uh, make it uh, uh, add up to the proper number of electrons. Okay, new example, formaldehyde or CH2O. CH2O, we have one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen. Now, carbon has four valence electron, electrons, oxygen, six valence electrons, two hydrogens, each with one valence electron apiece. So we're going to put all of those in there. Um, and we're going to add them up. And the number we are focusing on here is 12 valence electrons, 12. All right, now we have to arrange uh, terminal atoms around a central atom. We're going to find that since hydrogen always must be terminal, it's between carbon and oxygen. And carbon is, is less electronegative than oxygen, so it is in the center. 
It is in the center. Well, our two hydrogens and our oxygen are on the periphery, or rather, they are terminal atoms. So now our initial foray into this is to connect all peripheral atoms or terminal atoms with that central atom and draw around each atom except for hydrogen the proper number of lone pairs to give an octet to each. So let's look over here on the left. So this is what we've done. Already this may look a little weird to you, not adhering to the standard bonding model, and you'd be correct. Here we have hydro, uh, I'm sorry, carbon with three bonds emanating from it, one lone pair. We know that's false. Here we have oxygen with one bond emanating from it, three lone electron pairs. That is also false. So we've already, just based on the standard bonding model, identified that it's wrong. But uh, going with this, this is our initial guess. So we're going to add up all of these electrons as shown. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. That does not equal twelve. Does not equal twelve. So that means our structure as drawn is incorrect. And as we uh, recognized already. So when incorrect, we're going to take, remove a, uh, a lone pair from the central atom and from a terminal atom and to put a double bond or another covalent bond between them. So let's, uh, let's see how that would work. There we go. Now we would count again, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. And indeed, it, that equals our initial target number of electrons so that that structure would be correct. So we've spent quite a bit of time talking about covalent bonding and we're not done yet. We have a fair amount more to go because it's the most complex uh, type of uh, chemical bonding that we're going to be looking at. But we've looked at enough of it now so that we can move on briefly to define that third type of chemical bonding that we were talking about, and that would be metallic bonding. Metallic bonding. Now, uh, metallic bonding, whereas uh, ionic bonding is always between a metal and a nonmetal, covalent bonding is always between two nonmetals. Metallic bonding is always between two metals always between two metals, and it's almost always atoms of the same element. We're talking about an element here, uh, you know, metallic gold, metallic aluminum, metallic copper, an element. Um, now, so that sets it apart from the other two uh, uh, types of bonding that we were looking at. Now, metallic bonding bears a, uh, a similarity with covalent bonding in that it involves the sharing of electrons sharing of electrons, just like covalent bonding. However, uh, it is a delocalized sharing of electrons between atoms. Now, what does that mean? Well, to answer that, we have to go back and look at an example of a covalent bond, which would be localized sharing of electrons between only two atoms, between just two atoms. For instance, let's uh, take a look here. Here we have a covalent molecule, and if we look, uh, there is one particular covalent bond here between a carbon and a hydrogen that I am highlighting. And in this case, uh, we have this uh, covalent bond between this carbon and this hydrogen here, those two. Those two electrons in that covalent bond only orbit around each other, so between carbon and hydrogen. Now, carbon has a different electronegativity than hydrogen, so uh, it would be a polar covalent bond, but those two electrons only go around those two atoms, hence localized. They're sharing, but they're localized. Never would we see, say, these two, or one of these two electrons or, or anything like that, say, go up over to this uh, uh, carbon atom or up into this oxygen. They're always between just two atoms, localized electron sharing. But let's look at a representation of uh, an, an element of metal, shall we? Uh, so we had, this is an, uh, uh, an example of 
delocalized electron sharing. Here is our metal, and here are you know, the various nuclei in green here of, of that metal. And we find that around those nuclei, we can uh, have an electron here, but that it is delocalized is not just around two specific nuclei. It can, it can move, has room to move. And indeed, we can uh, have a flow of electrons through a metal. Notice they're going around different nuclei each time. I don't have to pick this particular direction, but understand we could go through any of, uh, around any of these nuclei and they would be delocalized. They're not just between two specific nuclei. Now, uh, metallic bonding is the basis for electricity. By definition, uh, electricity, uh, movement through, is a movement of electrons through a wire uh, or, or a metal. So we have that putting a potential on either end of a wire. We can draw electrons through that wire. That is a flow of electrons in one direction using uh, many different uh, of those metal nuclei. It makes use of delocalized electron sharing. It has to in order to have that flow of electrons, which makes sense. And the other uh, uh, end of it, the, the nonmetals are typically insulators because of their localized electron sharing. Uh, we, we don't have the ability really to move uh, an electron through a covalent structure we have to have that flow since we're limited by uh, those electrons being localized around two specific uh, atoms.